He has spoken on the topics faith, family and freedom in Cuba, Belgium, Brazil, Congo, UK and all over the USA to crowds from 14 to 40,000. International leadership speaker, trainer and coach. Author of Learn to Raw Leadership, Attitude Hack, Live a More Excellent Life, 5 Battle Strategies of a Victorious Warrior. 2021 President's Lifetime Achievement Award recipient. Founding partner of the John Maxwell Team. Toastmaster International Speech Competition Semi-Finalist. Founder of Tell It Like It Is TV, ThatGuyRocks.com and ThatGuySpeaks.com. Creator of Story Power TV, Transforming Grace TV, and Leading Leaders Podcast. Producer of four TV programs and podcasts for Liftable TV and World Trumpet Television as well as multiple social media channels. Please help me welcome J. Lauren Norris. I remember the first time I was told, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It came from an uncle who ironically at the time drove a 1966-67 Chevy Stepside pickup. You know, the blue one with the big bubble fenders and the white roof on it. It was also a Stepside, which means the spare tire hung on the left side right behind the driver's door on a little post that was mounted there. But his didn't have a spare tire there. It had a roll of baling wire and on a lanyard with a couple of carabiner clips, three rolls of duct tape. Yep. He would tell you about half of that truck was held together with baling wire and duct tape. And he wasn't kidding. The dashboard, duct tape. The drive shaft had its own little sling just in case it popped out again with baling wire. Half the shocks were held in place by baling wire. Underneath the hood, a whole lot of baling wire. But if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That was his philosophy. Hey, I'm really fascinated though because yesterday in a conference I heard someone say to the question, can we fix education from here? And the answer was, no, it's not broken. That's what I want to talk about today on Leading Leaders. Subscribe now for our extensive video library of leadership lessons promoting faith, family, and freedom. I'm Jay Lauren Norris with Leading Leaders Podcast, and I want you to know I was, I was a little bit perplexed when I heard the phrase, no, we can't fix education because it isn't broken. And part of the reason I'm perplexed is because over the last couple of decades, I've watched a lot of things evolve in school. And when I say the last couple of decades, let me make that three decades because our oldest daughter is now in her a little over 29. But she was the one who we put her in private pre-K and private kindergarten and private first grade and private second grade. And the first year she was in third grade, we put her in a very small community public school. It was about the fourth day that she came home and she said, Dad, they do baby math. I said, what do you mean by baby math? And so she showed me some of the stuff they were working on in the third grade public school classroom a couple of decades ago. And I thought, you're right, you're, you're a little ahead of that. Well, it was only a couple of weeks later that she was asked to bring extra things to read or to do because she was finishing the entire day's scheduled schoolwork before lunch. But they had to keep her occupied from lunchtime through the end of the day because she would sit in the classroom and talk to everybody else. And she was getting bad social scores even though she was off the charts on all of her academic scores. So we sent her to school with the children's Bible to read because she enjoyed reading the stories in it. And they made her put her desk and her Bible in the hallway because she wasn't allowed to have that in the classroom. And then finally, they just told us uh, she's not allowed to have it at school at all. Well, she finished the year with great grades, but with a horrible social skills conduct score. At that moment, it was when I realized, and this was more than a couple of decades ago, that that particular school system, like many other that I've been involved with, was less concerned with her academic achievements or playing at her greatest level, but instead was 
concerned about her conformity? Could she sit in the classroom, in her desk, and behave exactly the way they wanted her to? Not what was best for her, not what her parents thought was a good idea, the way they wanted her to. Now fast forward a few decades and we ended up intentionally homeschooling all of our children, her included. Until she got into high school, she went into all of her AP classes, then she went on to get her bachelor's degree, she's working on her master's degree in a very technical field. She's a very intelligent young woman. Not because of what the public school offered or didn't offer. Not because of what homeschool offered or didn't offer, because that's the way she was made. See, what I feel like the public school system didn't do for her was lead her to be the best her from the beginning to the end. I find the challenge in leadership to be that often we look at a system and we think it's not performing the way that I expect it to, therefore it must be broken. Well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Just put some bailing wire on it, put some duct tape on it, and rock on down the road, right? No, the better question is, why does it perform the way that it does? If it's not broken, and yet it's still performing to a standard that you don't expect, or it's doing something to get a result that you don't want, and I don't care if it's a system, if it's your database, if it's the driver for your printer, if it's... A, my wife has recently been struggling with some files. They updated a server and moved a server and something in her system got pushed down to a tertiary level, but the file archive would only go to the secondary level. And so while she's trying to merge these files back together, it simply wouldn't do it. The data wasn't gone, the system wasn't broken, but a simple reassignment made it not function properly. After we had a quite a conversation about that and she went back to IT and said, it's funny that if I put the files here, they work. And if I put them here, they don't. And I said, well, that's because that has to feed through to this and, and you've got to fix that. The system wasn't broken. The system was doing exactly what it was designed to do. But the result that you wanted couldn't be delivered by the system in that design. Which means you either have to modify your expectations and the outcome that you're desiring, or you have to learn to play with the system that you have. So let me return to my question about education. Is it broken? No. No, it's, it's doing exactly what it was designed to do. But remember, Sir Lawrence mentioned, I don't know, it's been five or six years ago on a TED Talk. He said, you know, understand that our school system was designed around the Industrial Revolution. What we needed in that time was to train people who are competent at a thing at a specific period in time, because that's what the assembly line requires. That's why all the desks are in little rows. That's why the school schedule is set to a bell schedule. That's why we teach one subject and we stop teaching that subject. We move on to the next subject. And when we're in subject A, we don't talk about B, C, and D. And when we're in subject B, we don't talk about A, C, and D. That's not the way it works on an assembly line. There's a reason the system was set up that way. Is it broken? No, it's functioning the way it was designed. Unfortunately, the way it was designed is outdated. It's outmoded, it's outmodeled. And as a result of that, there's a whole lot of not related to education content that's being shoved into the sausage grinder of the education system that's causing different ideologies to come to light when we're not talking about subject A, B, C, or D. We're talking about something completely irrelevant to those subjects, but apparently relevant to someone who has access to shove them into the system to be taught, indoctrinated, educated, however you want to put it. So how do we fix the system? Well, let me go back to my original comment. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. The system isn't broken. It's doing exactly what it's designed to do. The question is, for how long do we continue to use a system that's designed to do not what we need today, but what we needed 100 years ago? That's a whole different question. How do we modify, replace, update the system? Now, there's a, there was a certain period of time that I had a computer. It was called an Olivetti. This predates probably 75% of the people who are watching this program. The Olivetti was a computer that had no internal 
hard drive. No memory at all. Literally, in order to operate it, you had to have two of those little square disks that were rigid, but we called them floppy disks. One contained the operating system. The other contained the program you wanted to run. And once you put the operating system in and got the system up and running on its RAM, then you would pop that disk out, pop in the disk that had the operating program you wanted to run, word processing, calculations, whatever. And then you would put in another disk that would receive the data created by the program that you're creating. If you're writing a Word document, you had to have another disk to put it on. You couldn't save the same document as the writing document. Okay, when Windows came out, it would not run on that machine because the RAM requirement for Windows was more than that machine was capable of and you couldn't run it off of a floppy disk because there wasn't enough memory space or speed. At that point, my Olivetti became a paperweight. It doesn't matter how great it was the day that it was invented, it's now outdated. Now, just for giggles, my phone now has more processing power than that Olivetti ever had. My phone has more processing power, more data storage, more content available, more access to things around the world in my cell phone than the first $3,000 computer that I purchased. Systems have to be updated, modified, reprogrammed, rewritten, repurposed on a regular basis. And yet we have the same education process, system, data that we've had for over a hundred years. It's working the way it was designed to work. It just wasn't designed a hundred years ago to work in the society that we have now. That's not an evolution problem. That's a system malfunction problem. It does what it was designed to do fairly well. It wasn't designed for the day we live in today. It's really hard to fix what isn't broken. I don't care how good a leader you are. You can continue to pour money and thought processes and brainstorming sessions into it. But if it isn't broken, you can't fix it. It's time to rebuild it from the ground up, to reimagine Education, as some might have said, we need to reimagine law enforcement. We need to reimagine the process of education and ask, is what we're doing beneficial to the individuals that we're trying to educate, or is it more about making them all mass compliant and mass obedient? I can't answer that question for you, but somebody better answer it fast or we're going to be in even more trouble than we are right now. Now, let me take that to the final statement of my little intro here. <clears throat> you can no more fix a system that isn't broken than you can lead an intentional vagabond. An intentional vagabond would be someone who wanders constantly, someone who doesn't really have a purpose about their life. They're getting what they need for the day. Maybe you've seen the people holding signs that say, we'll work for food. Many of them in the past have had genuine careers. Many of them have advanced degrees. No joke. Sit down and ask them. Sit down and ask them. I've worked in the homeless shelters. I was on an advisory council for a group that served half a million people a year. Yeah, I've had a lot of conversations. I've had interviews with, I sat on the other side of the video camera while they were explaining how they got to be homeless and how they got out. Many of them have had major significant careers if you had conversation you would be baffled but many of them choose the life they have because they don't have the responsibility of a house payment they don't have to pay a electric bill every month they don't have to pay for medical insurance because they're indigent they are taken care of by the society and it's on purpose i was in a meter a mentors education meeting last night People who are intentionally putting themselves in the pathway to become mentors for people who are seeking a mentor. And one of the comments I made was, you've got to realize that one of the hardest things for a mentor, someone who desires to do good for others by helping them move forward in their life. One of the hardest things for that mentor is to ask the question that a rabbi asked a guy one time who'd been laying in the same spot for 37 years. The rabbi said, I, before we do anything here, let me just ask one question. I, I want to get this straight. Um, do, you, do you really want to get better? 
do you want to fix what doesn't seem to be broken? Now, see, a lot of people think he was mocking him. A lot of people think, well, that was a cruel thing to answer or to ask. Obviously, the answer is yes, that's why he's laying where he's laying. But the answer isn't so obvious because, remember, like many of the homeless, many of the vagabonds around the United States today and countries all over the world, to unplug for society and unplug yourself from the civil responsibilities, the civic responsibilities of home ownership and education and showing up for a job on time, et cetera, et cetera, does not necessarily mean society isn't plugged in for you. No, there's still benefits. There's still medical benefits. There's still homeless shelters where you can get free food and a, a free cot to sleep and and you can be taken care of in that way. And you can have all of the freedom of zero responsibility except to get yourself to the place where the food will be served or the bed will be made. That's all you got to do. Now, I know a lot of teenagers who would stay at their parents' house till they're 40, 50, 60 years old if the food was provided and the bed was provided and they didn't have to do any chores or show up with any level of responsibility, they would be intentional vagabonds for as long as it is allowed. It's hard to lead people like that. They don't have an ambition for the next better thing. Unfortunately, I see a lot of our education systems, our government systems, our voting systems, our body politic, our national challenges in a very similar way. Those who are benefiting from the system the way it's functioning now, the way that it's operating now, the way that it was designed to operate, they don't see it as a problem. They don't want it to be fixed. They don't want it to be corrected. See, if, if this guy actually was helped by the rabbi and learned to deal with life again on his own terms and then take life by the horns and go get a job and go get a career, suddenly he would have massive amounts of responsibility that up to this point he has not had. He's had people waiting on him hand and foot, literally delivering food to him, literally covering him at night to make sure that he was taken care of, making sure that he was provided for in every way. The society did that for him, to him. It's hard to lead an intentional vagabond. Someone who says, I don't want all the responsibility of that. I'll stay unplugged from society. I'll be off the grid, so to speak. I'll, I can do this letting everybody else contribute to me with me not really having to contribute anything. In fact, I challenge you the next time you see someone with a sign that says we'll work for food to offer them not money, not a handout, not a meal, but a job and see what happens. The majority of those that I have engaged with, 70, 80 percent or greater, don't really want a job. Now, from time to time, you run into the, the honest vagabond. The, the guy who is riding his motorcycle and literally camping out on the side of the road, a whole hobo pack on his back, was pulled over by somebody who said, you know, your back tire is about to pop. You really got to do something with that. Can I give you some money to put a tire on? And the guy said, if you give me money, there's a liquor store right there. That's where I'm going. He was an honest vagabond. He didn't have any intentions of getting his life right or getting his life fixed. He would stop when necessary, to do enough work to get enough money to put gas in his tank or food in his belly, and he would move on to the next place where he was unsettled, unexpected, a minimal burden on society, thankfully, but still not really contributing to society. It's hard to lead an intentional vagabond. Just as it is hard to fix a system that's not actually broken, it's just working in a way that you don't want it to work. It's doing something, just not what you want it to do. At that point, you need some strategical action. You've got to do something completely different than has been done before to invent a parallel system, a better system, another system to replace the outdated, antiquated, dysfunctional, vagabond system and create something better, create something that works. You're also going to have to begin as a leader to look for those who genuinely want to be led, who have an ambition to do the next best thing in life, to figure out what that is. What could I be the greatest in the world at? Lead those people. Those people want to be led. Those people have an idea where they're going. All they need is a little encouragement, direction, instruction, maybe a mentor to help them get there faster. If you'll invest your time there, you'll see greater success. You can't fix what isn't broken, what you've got to identify, is it broken or is it functioning dysfunctionally the way it was designed to, just not producing the outcome you're expecting? 
And are you leading people who are intentional vagabonds? They don't really want to be better. They really don't want to be led. They don't really want a solution to the problems they have. They're perfectly content with other people solving their problems for them. If you'll approach life with those two questions in mind, you'll find yourself showing a whole lot more success at what you endeavor to do as a leader. I'm Jay Lauren Norris with Leading Leaders Podcast for Tell It Like It Is TV. Have a blessed day.